Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Serenity Village Community Church Wednesday night Bible study. I want to welcome each and every one of you, whether you're watching this live right now or whether you're watching a playback version later. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for engaging in the conversations we're having here. Before we get started, I want to pray. So, Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather, even though we're apart, to be connected even though distance separates us. We thank you for the, the technology that's making this happen, the people that are sacrificing their time to make this happen. And so we each declare right now that we don't waste this time, we don't take it for granted, but we use it to further our knowledge of you, to further your kingdom, to spread your word, to learn more about you. So right now, I just thank you for that time that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, as you're, as you're listening along tonight, if something stands out in your mind, take a second, write it down, and come back later to, to ponder on it, to meditate on it later. If you're watching a playback version, feel free to pause this if something stands out to you and just take some time to really think about what's standing out to you. This is a Bible study, and the whole point is to study what is standing out, what God is trying to say to you, what His Spirit is saying to you. So please take that time. Don't feel like you have to rush through this thing to get to the end, and we're going to have a great time tonight. So... Our topic, we're covering a verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which most of you um, might already know the, the verse, the reference, without even putting it on the screen. You already know this one. It's a pretty popular one. And I've had a lot of conversations with people in the last few weeks where this is their go-to scripture for the crazy times that we're living in right now. And I've been thinking about this and what it actually means because I grew up in the church. And so I grew up hearing this scripture, you know, in youth group, it was the thing that our youth leaders would uh, give us as advice. If there was something going on, you know, they'd, they'd quote the verse and we'd take it home and it would be really helpful and really impactful at times. But I also realized for a lot of people, there's something kind of missing behind this verse. And before we get any further into it, let's just go ahead and read it. So it's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, and it says, Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And just that in itself should be such a comfort to us, especially during these crazy times. But I want to take this a bit further and a bit deeper. Let's peel back some layers here because that in itself is great and wonderful. And if this is one of your verses you've been holding on to and it's been inspiring you, this is not to come against that in any way. But I do want us to get a little bit more insight into what's actually going on here. Uh, because to be honest, I've had conversations last few weeks with people and they go to this verse and they know that they, they need to do what it's saying. But how do you actually do that? I mean, if you take a minute and actually ask yourself that question, how do you cast your cares on Jesus? There's a lot of translations that will say, cast your cares on him, um, cast your anxieties on him, give him your worry, give him your strife, give him your problems and things of that nature. But how do you actually do that? Because if you actually look at the words, it says to cast, to throw something, we can get that in a physical sense. But worry, anxiety, it's not a physical thing. How do you cast something that's not a physical thing? How do you give something over? And a lot of the responses people normally get are, well, you know, you pray about it, you take it to God, you, you have your worry, you bring it to him in prayer, and then you say, okay, God, it's yours, and you decide not to think about that anymore. And that's great, and that's true, and that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're gonna be honest, how many times does someone give you a piece of advice saying, hey, just don't worry about it, and that doesn't really help too much? Because it's almost, it's almost too metaphorical. It's almost too out there. It's almost as if it doesn't address the real problem because anxiety is kind of an intense word. It's a big deal. It's something coming against you that can actually affect and impact your life. And so I was thinking about this verse the last few weeks and I didn't really realize why it was on my heart so much. And then God brought another thought into my head, which seemed completely unrelated at the time. He reminded me of when I was in college and I had a business class with a professor. He had us do SWOT analysis. Now, some of you might be familiar with this. It's S-W-O-T for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And in a business application, what you do is you look at a situation or a circumstance and you say, okay, is this a strength of our business? Is this a weakness? Is this an opportunity or is it a threat? And so our professor had us go through a list of things that were affecting this business and putting them into categories. And so we take one thing and say, well, this is definitely a strength. Take one thing, this is definitely a threat. And we had a lot of things in the threat uh, column. And after the exercise, he said, 
you guys have a lot of things in the threat column, but what you don't realize is most of those threats are also opportunities. It's not one or the other. It depends on your perspective. It depends on how you're looking at the situation, whether it's a threat to you or whether it's an opportunity. Because an entrepreneur sees something that the vast majority of people look at as a threat and they see an opportunity. And there's a very real spiritual application into that. And so that example was coming to my head and I was trying to think of how that applies here. So I went and did a deeper study into 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 looking at anxiety, because to know what you're supposed to do something, you first have to know what it is. And I looked at the Greek word for anxiety there, and it was so interesting to me because it doesn't just mean a worry or a problem. The word and the root word that this uh, Greek word comes from, it is something in the, in the definition, and you can look this up, it's something that comes to you in order to divide your attention, to distract you, to split you into parts so that you are less effective. That's the literal definition of the word here. And we translate it into anxiety. So just understand that, that your anxiety, your worry, the things that are surrounding you that you're so concerned about, they're not just problems on your list of things you need to do. They are actual things sent to you by the enemy with the specific purpose of distracting you, of dividing your attention. Now, there are some other times we see this word used in the New Testament. Jesus uses this exact same word when he says a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the same word is used there. So we know this principle that Jesus establishes. If your split, if your attention is continuously divided, if your focus is split into so many different parts, you cannot stand. You will not have a long-term effect. So that's what anxiety is. It's not just something you are responsible to handle, even though we've talked about responsibility quite a bit and there's a lot to be said for us taking as much responsibility as we can. But that's not what this anxiety is. It's something that the enemy is throwing at you to distract you and to divide your attention. Now, knowing that, we can look at these circumstances around us and have a better understanding of what to do because it's, it's a very real thing. Anxiety is not, you know, some made up thing that doesn't really exist, doesn't really affect people. It's a very real thing. Distractions can be very real. I mean, picture, picture an action movie when someone, you know, is fighting an enemy and they say, I need a distraction. So they do something, they blow something up to cause a distraction to keep someone unfocused from their main goal. That's what's going on. You're the hero in the story. You have an actual enemy. There is a real enemy. So it's not to say that anxiety and worry aren't real threats or are, real, are not real problems. They're very real. Spoiler alert, there is a real enemy and he's out to steal, he's out to kill, he's out to destroy you. He has an actual mission to do that. But you are the hero in the story. And so the things he throws at you to distract you, once you recognize what they are, then we can start to move forward. So now we know what the anxiety is, but still, what does it look like to cast that anxiety on Jesus or on God? Because it's still kind of this obscure thing. And so I looked at that word cast as well. And the only other time that word is used is in the book of Luke, when it talks about Jesus's entry into, into Jerusalem, excuse me, Jesus's entry into Jerusalem, when the disciples go and get a donkey for him to ride on. And it says they brought it to Jesus and they cast their coats on top of the donkey and set Jesus on top of it. I don't think it's a coincidence that that word is only used two times in the New Testament. There and in 1 Peter 5, we see this real example of the disciples taking something, their cloaks, their outer garments, their coats, putting it to a use that was not ordinary use, that was very unconventional in order to support Jesus, in order to lift him up. So, so think of that in our context of 1 Peter 5 here. You can take anxiety and worry and problems, things that the enemy is throwing at you to distract you from your true calling, from your true purpose, and you can use those things to lift up Jesus. Now, I don't want this to become a cliche and, and get us into this mindset of, you know, whatever is going on in your life, don't worry about it. You can just use it to glorify God. I mean, that's true. You can glorify God in whatever circumstance. But if we're gonna be real honest, there's some circumstances where you do not feel like glorifying God. You feel like pain. You feel the worry. That's a very real thing. 
But what you can do now that you know what it is, is ask your father, okay, this is the situation we're in. What do we do with this? How can I use this to lift Jesus up? How can I use this to support Jesus? Now, I also wanted to look at a couple other verses here. In Matthew 13, verse 22, it says, the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. Now this is the parable of the seed and the sower. The one on whom seed was sown among thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worry or anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. That's the same word used in 1 Peter when it talks about your anxiety and your worry. It says the anxieties and worries of the world choke out the word of God. It chokes out what God is trying to produce in your life. And here's what it means. Let's ask ourselves this question honestly. How much time have we all put in the last couple of weeks devoted to a virus? How much energy, how much communication have we put towards something that is clearly not from God, that is from the enemy to distract, to divide, to cause pain and division? Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of it. I'm not saying we shouldn't have conversations about what's going on. In fact, quite the opposite. To not understand what is happening in the world is just to be naive. And a naive person cannot be courageous. A naive person cannot take what God has put on their journey. You can't do that if you're naive. So you do need to know what's going on. You do need to be aware of it. But if that has as much or more stay in our daily lives as the word of God, as the calling of the spirit on our lives, then it will start to choke out the word. It's just a matter of time. And I love Paul's encouragement to the, uh, to the church in Philippi in Philippians 2. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. One goal, one mission, one word, one cause, the cause of Christ. To be united in that as a church, as people, as Christians and believers in what may be the most difficult time of our entire lives. May that be our goal through all the distraction, through the worry, through the anxiety. Now, again, I know this isn't necessarily an easy thing to do at times because a lot of us are feeling the pressure of having lost a job, the worry of someone becoming sick, a friend or a loved one, the fear of what that's doing to the economy, what that's doing to our church gatherings. There's a lot of real worry and distraction out there. There's a lot of things that have to be dealt with, but let that not become our focus long-term. Let's ask the question, okay, this is all going on. This is crazy. There's terrible things happening. How can my father walk with me and show me what he has for me in this season and this time? Because that's what God wants us to be with him on. He wants to be with us in this confusion, in this chaos. He's a good father. He wants to lead and guide us through this. And now the end of 1 Peter chapter 7, or uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it says, because he cares for you. God cares what you're going through. And I don't say any of this to make it seem like God is up there so distant waiting for you to get over your worry, get over your anxiety before he comes down to you. He's actually the one that cares for you. What does it mean to care for someone? Let's think about that for a minute. Peel back the layers because it's not just, you know, if you fall down, he'll pick you up. That's not what it's talking about here. To care for someone, and I got a, a very interesting perspective on this since I became a father. If you are in charge of the care of someone, that means that their well-being, their prosperity, their health, their, their state of being is directly dependent on your ability and your willingness to provide what they need for them. That's what it means to care for someone. I have three small children. I, they are under my care. My wife and I, we care for them. They are not responsible for their own care. They are, however, growing in responsibility. And there are worries and anxieties that come along with that journey. So let me give an example. Um, my daughter, who is now five, recently turned five, she has been going through, you know, growing up, becoming a big girl. And there's things that happen along the journey. And I'm going to share a traumatic experience with you of the time she got her first splinter in her thumb. She was four years old at the time. It was actually just a few weeks ago. She got her first splinter 
There was so much worry, so much anxiety and fear when this happened to her because there was real pain. It was a very real pain. Now for me to say to her, don't worry, sweetheart, it's not gonna hurt forever. It wasn't very comforting because it was hurting right now. And she couldn't see an end to that hurt. Now, please don't write this off as just some childish example because the principle behind this that I learned is the exact same principle that applies to each and every one of us in our relationship to God, our Father. She couldn't see the end of the pain because this is the first time she experienced something to this degree. And it was traumatic for her. I mean, think about it. We're kind of used to the idea of getting a splinter. If you're a kid and you have something lodged into your skin that's causing you pain and you can't get it out, there's fear that comes into that. If you're an adult and there's a virus rampaging the world that you haven't faced before and you don't know if you're gonna get it or not get it, if your job's gonna stay open or close, there's a very real fear and pain there. So I took her, took her into her room, we got the nail clippers out and I explained to her what we were gonna have to do to get the splinter out of her thumb. And she didn't like that idea. And I wasn't in very deep, but she couldn't really see the difference because this was the first time she was experiencing this kind of pain. I explained to her, here's what we have to do to get it out. After a while, it will feel better. And I told her of times where I had gotten a splinter when I was a kid, so I understood how it felt. And I walked her through the process. Now, after about 45 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating, she was finally at a place where she was ready for me to pull the splinter out. And the second we did, maybe about two seconds afterwards, she realized, oh, wow, I was just brave enough to get through this circumstance. And it didn't matter that it took 45 minutes. She faced a situation that she had never faced before. There was fear, there was anxiety, but she believed the word from her father that he was gonna get her through it and that he was gonna walk with her each step of the way to get through it. And she did get through it. And that brought such a confidence and a courage in her that she is actually a different child now. And here's how I know she's a different child now because two weeks after that, she got another splinter. And what used to take 45 minutes to resolve now took a minute and a half because she had gone through it. She knew what the pain was. She knew the steps to resolve it. And she had trust and faith that I could bring her through it. So we pulled the second splinter out with almost no trouble at all. That's how we grow and develop. That's how we get through fear, anxiety, and worry. When you have a father who is responsible for your care walking with you and you see that play out, the confidence in you builds that yes, we can get through this. And then the next thing comes, yes, we can get through this. And psychologically, this is how people overcome fear. This is how people overcome anxiety. You don't get to make some world where you don't face fear. That doesn't happen. Any psychologist that I've talked to will not tell you that, well, the way to fix your problem of fear is to just make you never have to face that thing. It doesn't work that way because the world is a scary place. What you can do is willingly confront something and then realize that you have the strength necessary to overcome it. That makes you brave. I can't make you less afraid. I can make you more brave. That's what it means to cast our worries on Jesus to cast our cares on God. It means, all right, this is the situation we're in. I, don't, I haven't been here before. There's fear, there's worry and pain, but I realize it's ultimately just a distraction from the enemy to knock me off my focus, knock me off my core and what you've called me to. So how do we walk through this, Father? How do we walk through this? Now, the final thing I wanna share with us is to get back to this idea of the opportunity. I know it can be kind of a cliche at this point to say, what's the opportunity we have in this situation with the world changing? I, I kind of get that. But at the same time, if we let it become a cliche in our minds, then we won't really take action towards it. And I don't want us to get stuck in a, a thought process of why is this happening to me? I know that's been a question that a lot of people have been asking lately. Why is this happening now? Why is God allowing this to happen? Why, 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 what if, what if? And we can get stuck on so many bunny trails with that. But really, you're not gonna find a solution by asking that question, just to be honest. To ask, why is this happening now? You're not, gonna, you're not gonna grow that way. You're not gonna get a resolution that way. In fact, you see in the story of Gideon, that's how, that was his approach. When the spirit of God came to him and said, you mighty man of valor, get ready to deliver the people. He said, well, why is all this stuff happening to us? And God did not feel the need in that moment to defend himself. 
He just reminded Gideon of who he was, who he had made him to be. He said, you are a man of courage. You are a man of valor and you can walk through this. So on one hand, we do want to know why this is happening. We're very curious people. That's in our nature. But ultimately, that can't be our source of truth. Our focus needs to be, all right, God, you are going to get me through this. What's the next step? How do I take this opportunity to further the call that you have on my life, to, to grow in my relationship with you? How do I take this opportunity? And, and I know we beat that word to death at times, but I hope that we see what an opportunity this is. I realize the pain. I realize the destruction and all the negative things that come along with what's happening right now. But I hope we also see the opportunity because it's not just a threat. Think of this. So many people right now have been given time and it might not be given time in a very exciting way, someone lost their job, that's not a very exciting way to get more free time. I'm not trying to say that that is. And I'm not trying to say, just look on the bright side and things will be okay. But look at it as the opportunity. You now have the most valuable thing, time. Ask any business owner what their most valuable asset is. If they could have more time, that's what you would hear. So as we wrap up this Bible slide tonight, and again, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for the engagement on the comments. And I want to say this. I understand so many questions come up when we study the Bible, when we study verses, when we go deeper into the word of God. I get that there's so many questions that come up. How does that relate to this? What does that mean with this? And those are journeys that we can walk through together. But don't be afraid to ask the question. And don't ask it as if you're trying to justify yourself or trying to prove something. We're all on this journey together, okay? We're all facing things that we haven't faced before. So as we close it out, I wanna thank you guys for your, your time tonight. I wanna thank you for being here and for staying consistent, for staying in the word, for staying connected. And we're about to hear from someone tonight that's gonna to talk about our mental well-being and how staying connected is crucial in this moment. Um, before we get to that, I just wanna pray. And one more time, thank you to everyone who's making this happen, production. Thank you for all you at home that are sharing this, that are commenting and reaching out to other people to make sure they're okay, to make sure you're staying connected. We love you. And Father, right now we give you everything. We give you our time. We give you our energy. Help us to continually see what opportunities are in front of us and not to be naive and pretend that the world isn't full of pain to pretend that there isn't an enemy because we realize that there is, but we also realize who you are and the spirit that you have given us. We love you and we look forward to each and every step of this journey, knowing that you are a good father who has good things in store for us, his children. Amen. As we continue to bring you resources I'm extremely excited for our next presentation from Shauna Fenske. Shauna Fenske is employed by Be Kind of People. She oversees our therapeutic division. She has successfully seen over 50 people in the last 12 months. Now more than ever, mental health is a challenge. Shauna's got her master's degree in family therapy and in mental health. And she's going to bring you this presentation to help you. And it's going to be coming to you from a very practical standpoint with some spiritual components. Let me introduce to you Shauna Fenske. Thank you, Serenity, so much for having me tonight. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you, everybody that's tuning in tonight. Well, as we all know, a lot of people in the world right now are experiencing heightened anxiety and chronic stress. Pastor Jason just alluded to this, that anxiety is real, and a lot of people are experiencing that right now, and this can harm our well-being. So we are in a time when people just aren't feeling that safe, physically or emotionally. Some of us are realizing the effects of being home as much as possible and of social distancing and already from this last week. And now that the starting Friday, the governor um, is urging us to really continue these practices over the next several weeks in order to best care for everybody. And this is also causing heightened peaks of anxiety and stress in people. People that are home more are experiencing boredom, unmet social needs, heightened conflict with their loved ones, 
Fear of not being able to access medical care, mental health care, or even recovery care like usual. Um, people are having financial fears and just a lot of economical uncertainty, frustration at insufficient information, and fear of becoming sick and infected, especially people that are higher risk. And also there's another population of people that are realizing the effects um, and pressure and stresses of being an essential worker at this time. Um, they're realizing that they have increased risk to, and exposure to this virus. They have limited equipment and resources and support provided by, um, for, for physical and mental resources. Um, and many of these workers are actually finding it difficult to even provi provide for their basic needs right now, such as um, drinking and eating and sleeping. So we have moved from really a place of living to a place of surviving. And when we are in survival mode, the part of our brain that is responsible for that flight, fight, and freeze response is super, super active right now. And our brains are actually doing what they are supposed to do. Whenever we perceive a uh, threat or assessing danger, that response is supposed to be active. But like Pastor Jason just said when he was teaching, this is more than a threat. But when we perceive that, we will react to it. However, in this season, I really want to encourage everybody to not just react to what is going on, but to respond, to find the opportunity that is happening right now because we must adapt. We need to be able to take that energy of our stress response and move it and redirect it to really stabilize um, and manage and replenish these internal sources. And this is critical, and it's critical because when we have heightened anxiety or when we have heightened stress, it actually suppresses our immune system. And right now, more than ever, we know the importance of being strong in our immune systems, in our health, and furthermore, we know that when we're operating under um, unchecked or unmanaged stress and anxiety, uh, we are on edge. Everybody is on edge. We are not operating at our best. We're very susceptible to falling into old, unhealthy patterns. We're less patient, especially with those that we love. So being aware of how your loved ones and people in your community handle stress is really wise right now because when anxiety is high, our options are low. So I don't believe that we just need to survive this. I really believe that we can thrive through this and replenish, replenish those internal uh, resources, mental and emotional. We can make plans individually and as a couple and as a family how to best manage our households through what is happening right now and this situation. Because everybody has evidence in their life um, individually and as a nation of overcoming, of really coming out of this stronger. We've sensed and we've had and faced other threats in our lives right now. And I truly don't believe that this is any different. This could be one of the best and biggest spiritual awakenings that this country and world has ever seen. So let's talk about anxiety. It's normal. It's something that everybody experiences. It's an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes. And some of these physical changes to be aware of are increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, nausea, digestive problems, sweating, dizziness, headaches, sleep issues, rapid or shortness of breath, and muscle pain. Also, it's totally normal to feel sadness right now, but urging everybody to be aware of those depressive symptoms as well. Depression is characterized by persistent feelings of sadness, loss of interest, prolonged hopelessness, and potentially suicidal thoughts. And the physical symptoms of depression include fatigue, nausea, digestive problems, agitation, concentration problems, muscle, muscle and joint page pain, and appetite changes. So anxiety, like stress, is on a continuum. 
we are very susceptible right now um, to heightened levels, like I said earlier, of anxiety and stress. And the higher on the continuum that that moves, the more harmful to our well-being that it is and the more unmanageable that it can feel. So many people are feeling right now that their anxiety and some of these other mental health struggles that they're having are at times unmanageable. So if you're feeling that way right now or as we continue to navigate these uncharted territories, you are not alone. So tonight I have created some mental health homework tips to share with you, but before I do that, I wanna check in. I just wanna take a moment to check in everybody together. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a mind and body scan together. So everybody at home right now, find a comfortable seated position or lie down if you feel like it, but find a comfortable position that you can be in right now. And if you would, close your eyes. Bring awareness to how you are physically feeling. Don't judge how you are feeling, but rather be curious about it. Don't try to figure out why, just observe yourself. Start at the top of your head and start to just slowly scan down your body to your toes. What sensations do you feel? You may feel tense, a tingling, or pain somewhere. And just take a moment to just check in with how you are feeling physically. Now release your focus from your physical sensations and bring attention to your mind. Again, don't judge your mind or what you're thinking, but rather be curious. What thoughts are you thinking? Imagine that every thought that you have is moving on a cloud through the sky. And just observe it. Just observe that thought floating by. You may be wondering about something, a concern or worry you have, or how weird this exercise is. Just let the thoughts come and go and float by. Now bring attention to feelings that might be present right now. What are you feeling inside of your body? You might be anxious, you might feel sad, or maybe you're starting to become a little relaxed. Now I want everybody to let all of that go and bring your attention and focus back to me. What we just did was a mindfulness exercise. Hopefully, that helped to really center ourselves so we can focus as we move through some of this information-heavy um, material. I'll tell you more about why mindfulness is helpful as we go, but I put together these tips and resources to engage in on a daily basis, not just to reduce stress and manage our mental health, but to thrive in it. It is not realistic to do all of these every day, you guys, but I would really encourage everybody to try every single one of the tips and tools that I'm gonna share, at least once. If you try it once, you are way more likely to try it again. These are skills. Every single one of these are skills, and they require work and effort to really incorporate, that, incorporate them into your life, and for some of them, to make them a habit of character. It's not gonna be um, you're not gonna experience all the effects and outcomes in just one attempt. So bear with yourself and keep at trying to practice a lot of these things. They're good for your mental health. And I'm gonna educate you as to why they are good for your mental health. What does the research say about all of these strategies and tools? So be patient with figuring out what strategies and tools work the best for you. Imagine that you have a tool belt around your waist and you are in the process of really trying to build and find and select tools that you are gonna be able to have in your tool belt so when you are experiencing anxiety or you are experiencing any other symptoms or stress, you can take that tool out of your tool belt and use it as an intervention. So the first tool that I have for you, which everybody in the world right now is definitely 
um, saying to do, but it's to connect. We know the importance of connection. Social connection and relationship is the best and healthiest thing for us, especially in difficult times. We need it for survival. A lack of social connection has detrimental effects um, to both our well-being physically and mentally. Not only does it boost your immune system to be in healthy connection with others, it has numerous other benefits. We need to use connection as an intervention in this season. Not just because we are called to isolate physically does not need, mean that we need to isolate mentally or emotionally. So connect with family and friend, friends. Make a list of the people in your life that you wanna stay in consistent contact with during this season. That list will help you manage those connections and make sure that you're remembering to check in with people as well as reach out to people. Some of the things that you can talk about um, to, to acknowledge what we're all going through is how are you being impacted? How are you feeling? Ask people how, they're, how they are coping because they might have so many tools of their own that we're not even gonna cover tonight that would be of benefit to you and your family. Also ask them, what good are they finding coming out of this? It will help really encourage people to be in that more positive state of mind. So make sure you're connecting. Tool number two, positive affirmations. A positive affirmation is a statement or a phrase used to challenge negative ones. There is MRI evidence in research that supports how this tool can change the neural pathways in our brains and break negative self-talk patterns uh, and boost self-esteem as well as reduce stress, increase positive behavior and optimism. This is what science says. For the best results, create a daily habit. And it's no different. All of these you're gonna wanna be creating daily habits with the best that you can. Again, to make them a part of your character development and to really reap the benefits that come with utilizing each and every single one of these tools. Every time when pastor has us repeat after him and say, I am a champion, or whatever it is. That is an example of a positive affirmation. So fill your mind with those. Fill your speech with those. They're powerful interventions. A couple apps you'll see on your screen to really help you get in this habit. Um, one is called the Think Up app. Now I love this app because you can actually record your own voice on this app saying these positive affirmations. Um, and then secondly, the I Am app, also a great app to really start to get in the habit and get a feel for what is it like to make positive affirmations a part of your um, everyday talk and thoughts. Tip number three, journal. Journaling is writing down your thoughts and feelings. Research supports that journaling increases self-awareness, it fosters better processing skills, strengthens emotional regulation. And emotional regulation is critical in this season because our emotions are all over the place. So emotional regulation is really having the ability to know what you're feeling in the moment and then to express that uh, without cutting off from people or lashing out. Also what journaling does is it can boost your mood. It can increase your working memory and reduce stress, manage your anxiety, as well as other mental health struggle, struggles. So not only is journaling a very therapeutic tool, um, it will help you track some of your experience that you're having, patterns, it'll help you track growth over time. It's just a really good idea. So try to journal and set some time aside, even if it's just a few sentences or checking in and writing some feelings down, down on paper to start. Number four tip and tool is practice mindfulness. So the exercise we went through in the beginning of this, that was a mindfulness exercise. There are thousands more like it that are guided that you can do. And what mindfulness actually is, is, is a moment to moment awareness of one's experience without judgment. This is, that's what we did in the beginning and a couple apps that you can download to really start to practice being mindful, which is just being in the moment really is how I think of mindfulness. It really helps curb that anxiety and worried thoughts. And you can practice mindfulness 
anywhere at any time. While you're eating, you can practice mindfulness, paying attention to the different sensations and what the food feels like in your mouth. While you're taking a shower, you can practice mindfulness, what the shower feels like, temperature, all of it. Research supports that practicing mindfulness promotes greater capacities for calmness, concentration, focus, and clarity. It decreases negative rumination, which is thoughts that just keep going over and over in your head. It interrupts that, and it decreases emotional reactivity. It enables one to have more adaptive responses in times of stress, which is definitely a time of stress right now that we're all experiencing. So you'll see some of the apps on the bottom of the screen that are great to help you become more mindful and practice this tool. Headspace app, Happify app, and Breathe Meditation and Sleep app are great apps. Tool number five, practice compassion. Now, compassion is defined as the emotional response when perceiving suffering, and it involves an authentic desire to help. Compassion gets us outside of ourselves, and this is so important because anxiety is about I, anxiety, and so is depression. It's a lot of self-focus, so practicing compassion in this time can really help you get outside of yourself, and it's really helpful because it, research supports that connecting with another in me one another in meaningful ways promotes better, better physical and mental um, health. It speeds up recovery from disease and it lengthens the lifespan. Compassion is a form of generosity and giving, which this community is so strong in. So I urge you in this season to continue that generosity and giving. Research shows that giving makes us happier and more fulfilled and is a huge buffer against this stress and difficult situations. And it's contagious. So uplift as many souls and practice compassion as much as you can in, in all the things that you're doing. Tip number six practice gratitude. Now, this is one that has been being drilled home um, by our very own pastor and so many other people, and I will wholeheartedly stand behind it because gratitude is the quality of being thankful. It's a readiness to show appreciation for another person's goodness and uh, the value that they add to you, and then also to return that favor and show that kindness in return. It's a very desirable, not only trait, um, or emotion, but also mood. And it leads to better well-being for everybody, for yourself and for the lives of others. It has the potential to increase well-being for so many people. So gratitude um, is a virtue. It doesn't necessarily come naturally, especially in times like this. So it's something that must be cultivated. And that's exactly what Pastor was talking about earlier um, on his live segment, that gratitude, compassion, all of these things, they need to be cultivated, which means it requires effort and something from us to be able to engage in these tools and then in return reap something from it. That is why um, the more you practice, it becomes part of your character. So research and scientific evidence when it comes to gratitude. There's tons of studies, and I'll just share a couple things that it supports, but people that have a grateful heart and that practice and cultivate uh, gratitude more often have been able, been, been proven to be able to overcome the tendencies of entitlement, of taking things for granted, and for striving materialistically. It also supports that gratitude is foundational to our well-being over a lifespan. It increases life longevity. It has so many spiritual, emotional, relational um, benefits. They, they're insurmountable. It promotes optimal functioning. Gratitude is one of the biggest weapons that we can use and tools that we can practice in these times. A app that I love for this is the Gratitude Journal app. Very helpful if you're wanting to get into the habit and start practicing um, being, being grateful until it becomes second nature. Tool number seven, relaxation techniques. Now, I wanna stress that relax, relaxation techniques are not just about peace of mind or engaging in a hobby. Relaxation is a process that significantly decreases the effects of stress 
on our bodies and our mind, and when practiced regularly, produces so many benefits for your health. These techniques are also skills um, to help you cope with and manage this stress as it comes and as it goes in the season. So the specific techniques that I'm gonna share with you um, really have been shown scientifically to decrease your heart rate, lower blood pressure, improve digestion, reduce stress hormones, increase blood flow to major organs, and reduce muscle tension and pain. Also improving your mood, sleep quality, and lowering fatigue as well as anger and frustration. So in a nutshell, relaxation techniques are good for you. They work, they help, they ground, and they center. So the Calm app you see on your screen is an incredible, incredible app to help you practice and learn some of these techniques. I'm just gonna go over a, a few here. The first one is visu visualization. So when you are practicing this, you form mental images in your head and take yourself on a visual journey to a peaceful, calming place or situation. Try to incorporate as many senses as you can, including smell, sight, sound, and touch. If you imagine, say, relaxing at the ocean, for instance, think about what the, what the smell of the salt water is like. Think about listening to the crashing waves and feeling that warmth of the sun on your body. For me, with the picture that you had just seen up there, mine is imagining that I'm in a field full of lavender with the breeze going. That is a, that is a visualization exercise that keeps me grounded and that I love to go back to um, and imagine myself there. It's relaxing, it calms me. So come up with something for your own. There's so much creativity you can have in this. You can create all different kind of journeys and experiences that will help you. Second, muscle relaxation. Now, this is a mind and body practice that is used to tame stress and decrease tension in the body. Research supports that regular practice helps manage and reduce stress as well as anxiety. And it helps people that have difficulty falling asleep. So there are many different ways to do this and you can do it similar to what we did with the mindfulness, starting at your head and working down to your feet. But what you do is you take and you tense certain parts of your body and you squeeze and you hold for five seconds and then you release. And you can do this before you go to sleep, while you're laying in bed, anytime you feel that your muscles are tense. And then wait 20 to 30 seconds before you move on to the next body part or move down your body. Breathing. Breathing practices, in my opinion, are the best tool. One of the best tools to decrease anxiety and stress and reactivity. Breathing fosters becoming more in touch with your mind, body, and spirit. Breathing exercises reduce stress levels. They're also referred to as belly breathing, which is actually the most effective and efficient way to breathe. Many adults breathe through shallow chest breaths, which, which can actually increase anxiety because you're limiting oxygen flow to moving through your body and getting to a lot of your major organs. Again, when we're feeling anxious or stress, we're restricting that oxygen in our body, so breathing can really help circulate, especially the belly breathing, can help you get that oxygen back where it needs to go for you to be optimally functioning. So when you do this, you can sit up and you can put your hand on your belly or you can lay down. And what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna breathe through your nose, slow for four counts, hold for four counts, and breathe out for four counts, and then repeat that cycle, that squared breathing. And that's a really good, very general basic breathing tool, belly breathing tool to help reduce stress. And lastly, mantra. A mantra is a motivating or calming word, image, or sound, scripture, or phrase that you can repeat over and over again in your head. Mantras help reduce negative and intrusive thoughts and help really quiet your internal mind in general. So long as that repetitive 
phrase or word that you are using is a positive one. So for me, mine is, you're gonna be okay. And that is inspired by um, the worship song by Jen Johnson, You're Gonna Be Okay. And I kinda just sing it over and over in my head, and it really stops when my mind is going rampant or I can't stop the thoughts and intrusive thoughts or negative ruminating thoughts. Re having a word that you can repeat really helps break that cycle. Tool number eight, take a break. During times of heightened stress and anxiety, we are more prone to physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion and burnout. Also, screen time is rising right now because all of, we're, all of us are on our phones and we're staying connected that way. So pay attention to some of the side effects that can come from heightening screen time. So these are some signs that you might need a break. Difficulty focusing, feeling overwhelmed. You are experiencing physical symptoms like we talked about earlier with any of the anxiety or depression symptoms. Strained eyes, you're feeling re restless um, or you're just really, really drained. This is a good ind indicator that you need to take a break to really uh, refresh your heart and brain because that's what breaks do. They renew you, they replenish those resources so you can go again and get through and do what you need to do. This is important, especially for essential workers right now that are finding it difficult to even meet their basic needs. So making sure you're at least taking breaks. Now there are different kind of breaks here. You wanna be able to take relational breaks. People that are under the same roof and confined are finding this out. Now, it may have been a dream in the beginning of your relationship dating that you would be together 24 hours, seven days a week. And for some, it's becoming, it feels more like house arrest now. So keeping in mind that taking time outs from your loved ones in the same vicinities is how you can really maintain that connection. It's good for you to be able to stay connected by taking breaks from your loved ones and remember coming up with a schedule or how you're gonna manage the household when you are all together. Movement breaks, we know the importance of this. We know that we need to be moving our bodies. We need to be eating right as best as we can. There's a lot of um, communities that are getting creative and going outside in the streets 10 feet apart and doing some movement exercises. So making sure that you're moving and you're taking those kinds of breaks. Rest breaks, actual sleeping, not interrupting your sleep cycle too much, trying to stay regular and have a routine bedtime and you're not all over the place or you're not sleeping too much. That's another thing to look out for, that you're not doing that too much in this season when you have the time. Mental breaks. It's important to take mental breaks when you're feeling overwhelmed. Same with emotional breaks. If you're just trying these things and you're emotionally overwhelmed, you can unplug and... Um, time out on the emotional, tending to your emotions. Spiritual breaks, very important here to study and meditate and find new and mean, meaningful ways to connect and break have, and find rest in God in these times. And then lastly, nature breaks. You wanna take nature breaks. We have gotten the go-ahead so long as we're not really being in groups doing this, but being outside, going for a walk, going for a drive with your windows down, like Pastor had suggested, blasting your favorite song, um, going for a hike, doing something with the intent of really connecting to nature, because that does something to us and for us when we're able to do that. So making sure you're taking breaks. And tip number nine, Reflection. So introspection or self-reflection, in other words, is meditation of your thoughts, your feelings, your motives, and your behaviors. Now, because of how busy our culture is, many people don't take the time to self-reflect. But a lot of us are finding right now that that is what we have. Like Pastor Jason said, time is our most precious commodity and it's something that we're being given right now. So taking advantage of that time. Um, because research supports that Reflection increases your self-awareness, your insight, your emotional regulation. It enables you to cope better with life's challenges. However, maladaptive um, reflection, again, the negative rumination or the self-critical thoughts, that's not healthy. That's not what reflection is about. Yes, we may get convicted, but we want to be reflecting on that and being curious to it and making changes because this time 
all of us are confronted with hard questions that are gonna change the course of our life, many of us. And so we need to take the time and do our due diligence to really reflect on what all this means to us and how we can really grow and change and see the opportunities as we move through this. The most um, effective, that reflection, the most, most of the time that it's most effective is when you are prepared to do it, when you have a relatively quiet mind and you are going in with the intent to reflect. And then lastly, mental health resources. This is the last tool. Now there are so many mental health resources that are popping up every single day. It's almost overwhelming to try to keep track of all of those that are happening daily. People, the University of Minnesota, Minnesota Recovery, everywhere is coming out with resources that are free for people to utilize in this time. So pay attention, do Google searches, ask other people what resources they're finding helpful. On the bottom of your screen, these are some more apps that were really created for people to help their mental health. They're very specific, as you can see, anxiety reliever, anxiety coach. These are some apps that were developed for you to help manage and reduce some of these symptoms, not just in the season, but always. These are great apps. Take a look at them. Um, and then I know that Serenity Village will be posting also uh, some of the resources that I'm putting out for you. We have numbers that you can call in for extra support at this time. And again, so many people, so many things that are happening and providing resources and platforms to use. So I'm going to be posting these also on my own mental health um, or on my own therapy page and my Facebook page. If you want to follow some of this, you can go to Shauna Fenske Therapy on either Instagram or Facebook. And I'll be also breaking these tips down and having conversations more about them as we go. So stay, stay tuned for that. Um, I want you to know that I am a resource for you. My hope and prayer is that you can develop healthy, healthy habits in this season and practice these tools. Don't just write them off as, oh, they're foo-foo, they sound good, but actually practice them. Take the time to let them become part of you, and I promise you will see the difference. It's not just scientifically supported. It's spiritually supported. All the people that are walking around with fruit and joy in these times, I can guarantee you that a lot of them are doing a lot of the things and tools and employing those like we just shared. If you have any questions or you need any guidance or suggestions, please don't hesitate to ask. If you want more suggestions regarding your unique situations or questions about any of the tools that you see behind me, please, again, don't hesitate to reach out. I am here for you. Serenity family, we're all here for you. We're all in this together, but most importantly, we know that God is with us and we are deriving our strength from him in this time to be able to do all of these things so we can help each other through this to stay strong in all of the areas, spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. We can help each other stay strong through this and come out on the other side better as a result of it. So don't lose your focus. This is still the year of focus. Look into yourself and practice these tools. When this stream ends, we're gonna have a breathing exercise to kick off this homework. So stay tuned right on your screen. It's gonna be about a minute and a half. Just follow the guide and then stay tuned for future. Thank you so much for tuning in and God bless.